So the other day I was thinking about the Idaho 4 case, again, as you do when a case is as shady as this one, and I was considering an alternative theory, one where the attacks start on the second floor. Everything I say in this video is just alleged, my opinion for entertainment purposes only, you know the drill. Now, in my last video about the Idaho 4 case, I talked about the possibility of there being someone who was fixated on one of the girls, potentially Kaylee. I don't like to use the word stalker because I don't think it was a stalker in a traditional sense, but more so someone who was infatuated with Kaylee, someone who was... Uh, who maybe even knew her, but their feelings were not reciprocated, and maybe that was the culprit. I know that it has been stated that Brian Koberger, the current suspect, did not stalk any of the victims, but let's just open our minds to the possibility that perhaps it was not Brian who did this. I hope they have the right guy, I have said this a million times, but potentially it could have been someone else. Maybe he wasn't a stalker, but that doesn't mean there was no stalker. Either way, you can check out that theory later. I'll put it in the description box below. I also have uh, an entire Idaho 4 playlist where I went over everything in a chronological order, more or less. Um, but for this video, let's dive into a possible alternative theory of how the events may have unfolded and this one ties into the DoorDash delivery. So at around 4 a.m. on November 13th, 2022, Zana's DoorDash gets delivered to 1122 King Road. Some of you, many of you, in the comments under my previous videos have been saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would Zana order DoorDash? Because allegedly, according to Zana's dad, she told him that night, around midnight, that she and Ethan were at home eating pizza. Now, we need to slowly dissect everything here. So I found an interview with Zana's mom, Kara. She spoke to a couple of YouTubers back in October 2023, and she essentially confirmed this story as it was told by the dad. So here's the clip. There is an interview with Jeff, Zana's father, where he yeah. says that he had spoken to Zana around midnight and that her and Ethan were already home. That's what he told me personally, was that he spoke with her and that, you know, they were at the party and that there was that altercation and, mm -hmm. um, you know, she was fine. She was at home. She was fine. You know, I think maybe she, she told her dad that, you know, because she didn't want him to worry and, and he was ready to get in his car and, and drive over there because he was in Pullman and he was getting ready to drive over to check on Zana. But Jasmine, I, she was like, no, dad, you've been drinking. Don't drive. So. Um, I, I don't know if she ordered food at midnight. I, I don't know anything about that, but I do know that there was the fight. It's my understanding that they were eating pizza at home. So that's what's that, what's, that's a little bit weird to me, too, that there was a door dash at 4 a.m. That, that's something that I was thinking, but I couldn't find anywhere where he mentioned that. And might, he might have never mentioned it like anywhere in the public. You know, that might have just been conversations that you guys had between the two of you. First things first, just like Jules has mentioned, I also could not find the interview with Jeff Kernodal where he would specifically say that Zana was eating pizza. It's a little bit unclear, that interview that he gave, but yeah, he did say they spoke at around midnight and uh, that she was fine, she was home. I heard from her uh, yeah. before we went her out, I think midnight. midnight. They were just hanging out at home. Yeah. Santa was hanging out at home uh -huh. with her boyfriend. If you happen to have a link to an article or an interview where we have that statement that specifically mentions pizza, feel free to leave it down below. But as far as the whole situation goes, this clip that I just showed you with Kara Northington, it seems to be a clip that gives the most context. Of course, we can't be 100% sure that even if Jeff spoke to Zana, that she was telling him the truth about being home. And also, we're not 100% sure what home means in this context. Now, yes, this could have been her home, the King Road residence, but I guess there is a chance that it was Ethan's home, whatever that may have been. Either way, I think there are definitely scenarios where even if Zana and Ethan had had pizza earlier that night, they would still order DoorDash a couple of hours later. I don't think this is as strange as some people may think it is, and let me explain why. So if the pizza thing is true, they most likely had it 
once they got back from the Sigma Chi party, if we assume that home is the 1122 King Road residence. There are two conflicting timelines as to when Ethan and Zana may have got home. The surviving roommate, BF, reported that allegedly Ethan and Zana got home at around just before 2 a.m. But according to Zana's dad, they would have been home already a couple of hours earlier, so at around midnight. Again, this is speculation, but hypothetically, let's say Ethan and Zana were home at midnight and they did have some pizza. Why would they order DoorDash a couple of hours later? There are four hours between midnight and 4 a.m. It's quite possible that this was leftover pizza and they had maybe one slice each, so it wasn't really that much. Or maybe, again, speculation, maybe they had some substances that make you hungry. If they did stay up all night, you know, maybe they were dancing, partying, whatever. They were spending energy. So would it be that unusual to be hungry again after four hours or so? I don't think so. I do think it is very suspicious that the DoorDash delivery almost completely matches up with the time when the attacks allegedly started. That is one hell of a coincidence. And that's why I think there is something a little bit more to that DoorDash delivery. Let's go step by step. And let's remember, there was no sign of forced entry into the house, according to law enforcement. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. That led to people believing that the door was perhaps unlocked or that someone knew the code, which is all very possible. But there's also a chance that perhaps the attacker or the attackers didn't need to force their way in. They didn't need to know the code, the combination, and they didn't have to wait for the perfect moment where the back door or the front door would be unlocked. It's quite possible that the victims let the criminal or the criminals in not knowing what was to come. What if there was no panic and no noise at first because whoever entered the house was a familiar person? I, I do wonder, you know, were the attackers perhaps already inside the house when the DoorDash delivery was made? Maybe they were hanging out with the victims because, as I said, maybe the victims knew them. And the reason why DoorDash was delivered in the first place or ordered in the first place was more so for them, not so much for Ethan and Zana. Ethan and Zana had already eaten at midnight, allegedly, but perhaps some visitors arrived later and that's why they needed to order more food because there were more people at the house. Per the PCA, per the roommate's statements, all residents were at home at around 2 a.m. and in their rooms by 4 a.m. So perhaps Ethan and Zana arrived home first and then their visitors, whoever these attackers were, arrived later. And so one possibility is that the roommates did not see them, hear them, because they were sleeping or whatever they were doing. But the other possibility is that they mistook those visitors for Ethan and Zana. Perhaps the roommates didn't know that Ethan and Zana had already been home and they just heard someone enter and they thought, oh yeah, it must be Ethan and Zana returning because who else is left? What if these attackers were hanging out with Ethan and Zana first with the plan in their mind, waiting for the right time. And the right time came when Zana went to pick up her DoorDash, which maybe the attackers encouraged her to order so that they would, you know, distract her, get her out of the way. As horrible as it sounds, it would be convenient. You're left with one person in the room and you can deal with them. And when the other person returns, they don't know what's happening. It's a complete surprise attack. It would also explain why Ethan was found by the police further inside the room and Zana also in the room, but she was visible from the hallway. So a little bit, I guess, closer to, to the door. And again, it would also explain why there perhaps wasn't any screaming or panic in advance. It wasn't this unfamiliar boogeyman who entered the house under cover of night. It was someone who knew the house, who knew the residents and the residents knew that person or people. They wouldn't have been instantly alarmed if they saw them in the home. Now, if we continue this theory, perhaps the attack woke up both DM and Kaylee on the third floor. Maybe Kaylee woke up a few seconds prior to DM. DM was then awoken by the noise on the second floor, but also by Kaylee and perhaps Murphy, who, you know, also was, was restless. That's when DM heard Kaylee say there's someone here, 
possibly to Maddie, and it's very likely that the attackers heard that too. Like I said in my previous video, if DM didn't just open her door, but she actually yelled something out for, you know, the people making the noise to be quiet, what if the attackers weren't able to locate the source of that noise? They just heard that someone was up, they heard a girl's voice, perhaps that combined with possibly Murphy making noise upstairs, possibly Kaylee making noise upstairs. That made the attackers believe that the noise was coming up from the third floor, not from the second floor. Perhaps they did know that DM also lived in the house, but they just didn't think that she was awake. Well, then how did Kaylee end up in Maddie's room? Well, the logical assumption would be that perhaps she went to warn her friend. We also know from the grub truck video that Maddie was a little bit more intoxicated that night. Perhaps she was more sound asleep and her reaction time was slower. That also possibly explains the difference in their injuries, in Maddie and Kaylee's injuries. Perhaps she wasn't as conscious to, to put up as much of a fight as Scaly, who was more alert. Okay, but what about Murphy? Why didn't he bark and try to protect his owner? Well, we don't know if he didn't bark. In fact, we assume that he did because there's allegedly uh, the sounds of dog barking on uh, the ring camera. Maybe Kaylee did close the door behind him and left him in the room when she went over to Maddie's so that he wouldn't run downstairs. There are a million possible scenarios here. So what about the elephant in the room, the suspect vehicle? Honestly, if you told me that that was the DoorDasher's car, I would totally believe you, judging by all the twists and turns and how it was maneuver maneuvering around the neighborhood. But since we're made to believe that that was not the DoorDasher's car, that this was the suspect vehicle after all, well then, I guess the getaway vehicle is possible. Maybe the attackers arrived on foot, but then they wanted to get as quickly and as far away from the crime scene as possible, so they called someone over as the getaway driver. Maybe that's why it was circling around the neighborhood since 3.29 a.m. Maybe whoever was in that vehicle was waiting for the attackers to be finished with what whatever they were doing, or they were waiting for the signal. They didn't know when that would be, so they drove around for a little bit. Remember, there's about half an hour um, of time where that vehicle is not in the neighborhood. It starts at 329 or something like that. It comes into the neighborhood, then it leaves, and it doesn't come back until 404, which could have been right around the time of the attacks, or right after the time of the attacks. And so perhaps the attackers knew when the DoorDash was arriving, so that's when they called their getaway driver back to to the neighborhood because they knew that as soon as DoorDash arrives, their attack would start. So they needed the getaway vehicle to be there as well. If Brian Koberger is involved, maybe that was his role. Or maybe it was someone else entirely. Or maybe this whole theory makes no sense. But do let me know, does any of this make sense to you? Share all your comments and thoughts and theories in the comments below, as always. Thank you very much for watching and for your time. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and uh, I'll see you very soon.